Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Training and Communications Officer with Australian Biocommons and I'll also be your host for today. In this series of webinars, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools for the life science community. Each month we hear from our local and international peers who present a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australians to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest Australian Biocommons news and events via the channels listed on your screen. Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Turrbal and Yuggera people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Alexander schmidt Labune, who to speak to us about conflict in multi-gene data sets. Alexander is a research scientist at the Centre for Australian National Biodiversity Research at the CSIRO. He is currently lead of the Phylogenomics Bioinformatics Working Group for the Australian Angiosperm Tree of Life Initiative and leads a future science platform environomics project on high throughput sequence capture. Alexander's research interests include the systematics and evolution of flowering plants, in particular of Asteraceae, the daisy family, biogeography, user-friendly species identification tools, including the application of computer vision and polyploidy. He uses DNA sequence data to resolve phylogenetic relationships and understand the evolution of Australian native plants. Welcome, Alexander, and I will now hand over to you to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, I assume everybody can now see the slides and hear me, otherwise please warn me. Um, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak about this and I'm very grateful for everybody's interest in this topic. What I want to talk about today, uh, first I want to give an overview of what this is uh, about and why we are interested in this. Then I'm going to do a quick uh, it's probably not going to be absolutely brand new to everybody, but a quick overview of the nature of the data we're going to use in the phylogenomics pillar of genomics for Australian plants versus uh, traditional Sanger loci. And then the three topics that I really want to discuss are uh, deep coalescence, pyrology, and reticulation, three different processes or patterns that can lead to incongruence in our data sets. What is the background here? Genomics for Australian Plants is a initiative uh, that is co-funded by Bioplatforms Australia and a broad variety of state herbaria and other research organizations. We have three aims in Genomics for Australian Plants. First, develop genomics resources. Second, um, to increase the understanding of the evolution and the conservation of the Australian flora. And third, to increase our capability as a botanical community to make use of genomic resources and uh, modern analytical methods. There are three pillars or activity areas in genomics for Australian plants. Uh, the assembly of reference genomes for the Australian flora, phylogenomics, also known as Australian angiosperm tree of life, and conservation genomics. And it is the phylogenomic area that this uh, webinar falls into. This webinar is um, part of more efforts at increasing our capability and helping each other. Um, there is going to be another webinar, more on that later, and a series of three workshops associated with the Australasian Systematic Botany Society meeting that is taking place in July. Please visit the conference website for additional information if you're interested. So again, this is about phylogenomics, and the premise here is that either in GAP or in other projects, we are now dealing with large numbers of low copy nuclear genes. In the case of the Australian angiosperm tree of life produced with sequence capture, also known as target enrichment. Um, and the premise is also that we have got sampling uh, with a uh, fairly, um, you know, one per genus or one per species or perhaps just, you know, one per subspecies or variety 
coverage. So uh, the kind of problem that is really phylogenetic, uh, pretty much above species level and even deeper about you know, understanding the evolution of a genus, a tribe or a family. And it is uh, not about species delimitation or population genetics uh, or other related problems. So the data we're using then from target uh, capture from sequence enrichment, however you want to call that, how does that compare to the data we've traditionally been dealing with? I've already indicated um, primarily we're using the angiosperm uh, 353 kit as the name implies, uh, we're going to have hundreds of different markers. Whereas usually in uh, Sanger-based studies um, that I also started with, we had only just between one and five markers generally per study. And a, in addition, we get considerably more raw read data even per marker and per sample. So uh, in the Sanger age, we had a forward read and a reverse read. And so they would um, add up to a few megabits of trace files that we would get out of the sequencer before we build context. With our enrichment data that we're going to have and are now starting to come in, uh, we have at least hundreds of megabytes potentially a few gigabytes of raw data that we have to analyze per sample. So that's uh, considerably more challenging to then uh, arrive at our alignments. In addition, because uh, the Sanger data were nearly always drawn from high copy regions of the genome, primarily the ribosomal and uh, the plastid, uh, nuclear ribosomal and plastid um, genomes, we could concatenate generally into two phylogenies, the nuclear and the plastid one. And uh, then we often found that they had at least slight incongruences with, between each other. In this case, with hundreds of genes, hundreds of nuclear low copy genes that are uh, pretty much inherited and recombined independently, we have a lot more incongruence. And the processes that cause this incongruence is of course precisely what the talk is about. And finally, this is not central to our concerns today, but just as a little side remark, often the Sanger markers that uh, we all started with uh, would either be non-coding uh, regions, um, perhaps uh, spacers or introns, or they would uh, in some cases be coding, but then they would be uh, tRNA uh, regions, for example, in the chloroplast, so they're coding but not protein coding. So often it made intuitive sense to um, partition our data sets by sequence region. Whereas if in GAP, for example, we're using something like the angiosperm 353 kit for our um, uh, enrichment, all those genes that are being targeted with that kit are protein coding. So we may want to consider partitioning our data set by codon position because, of course, the third one is evolving much faster than the other two. I also want to give a very quick overview of um, where in our overall analysis pipeline, which is of course very um, simplified here, we are sitting with today's presentation. We start with, uh, as mentioned, a lot of um, raw reads from next gen sequencing. They get assembled against a reference sequence. And uh, then for each gene and each species, we hope to get at least one contact. But if there are different variants of the gene in a given species, then potentially more than one. More on that, obviously, later. And uh, then across all our samples or all our species, we build gene alignments for each gene. And then we have three main ways we can do the phylogenetic analysis. Uh, either the so-called shortcut methods or a concatenated analysis or a full multi-gene um, coalescent analysis uh, in uh, Bayesian software such as BEAST. Now, crucially, what this uh, webinar is focusing on is this lower part here. We assume that we have got the gene alignments um, uh, across all our samples. And we want to figure out if we've got conflicts in the data, how we get to a species phylogeny. We assume, on the other hand, that this uh, first part of the pipeline here has been done well and without any fundamental problems. So we assume that the assembly has worked so that we do not get any chimeras in our context. Nothing has been uh, assembled together that shouldn't have been assembled like that. And we assume that, for example, in the high pipe assembly pipeline, we have actually discovered all the potential variants of a gene uh, that I'm going to talk about later with the Paralog Finder script. Uh, if we don't do any of this right, of course, we're going to mislead the um, downstream analysis, even if we do them in principle correct, because they're, they're being fed bad inputs. So 
the three processes that I want to talk about again are um, incomplete lineage sorting and deep coalescence first, then second, uh, gene duplication and loss, parallel uh, parology and orthology, and then third, reticulation, things like uh, hybridization, interrogression, chloroplast capture. Now, none of these processes are newly discovered. Um, there's a very, very good review article, uh, very early from 1997, that I can recommend as, as a very nicely written introduction. It is just that with the kind of data we have today, this is becoming an ever more burning issue than it would have been 10 or 15 years ago. In each case, I want to consider the following. First, what actually is presumed to happen? What is the biological process uh, that is causing the incongruence? Then what would it look like in our data? How would it present in our data? And here, assuming in the first instance, an ideal case. So we would assume that only the process currently under um, consideration is causing our incongruence, not interfered by any of the others. And we have a perfect data set with everything that we need to immediately see what is going on that is, uh, needless to say, not necessarily realistic in real life. And then third, Without going into too many of the details, just a quick overview of how we then get from our incongruent um, alignments and gene trees to the species tree. So just what are the approaches that are being used in principle and a few software options. And I should add, we want to make the slides of this talk available. And the last two slides of this presentation here are a variety of references to review papers and methods and software announcements with links that I hope will be useful to anybody who's interested in this area. Starting now with the meat of the webinar, first, deep coalescence and how it is caused. What we see here at the bottom is a tiny um, uh, made up species phylogeny of three species, the time axis going from the left to the right. And they have been caused by two speciation events. And in each case, inside the species, we see these little groups of um, two connected dots. Each of this pair of dots is meant to be an individual in those species lineages. And the color of the two dots is indicating what alleles for a given gene they have, one inherited from the mother, one inherited from the father, and then hopefully they uh, pass that on to some of their descendants. And the key point of this graph here is to illustrate um, what might happen with uh, random selection of alleles at speciation events and then uh, their evolution afterwards. So in this case, we have an extremely colorful ancestor that would have started with uh, perhaps an unrealistically large number of different alleles. And then at each speciation event indicated, for example, by the first arrow, the two daughter lineages randomly grab some kind of subsample of uh, the allele diversity that is available in the ancestor. And so we may have a situation as indicated with a second arrow where one species has got alleles that are paraphyletic to the alleles in the sister species or in, in other close related species. If we kind of envision uh, the, a, a gene tree and an allele tree, um, it would show one of the species as paraphyletic. And then as we see, um, over time, however, we lose allele diversity in individual lineages. Now this uh, simulation here presumably assumed that no new ones would be generated by um, mutation. But even then, uh, there's limited space in each species lineage and uh, through a process merely known as genetic drift, even without any selection going on, just purely because randomly some of the alleles will get rarer and then uh, sometimes have the luck to disappear entirely. If you wait long enough in a species lineage, um, the alleles in that uh, lineage will become monophyletic again. But this situation here, this intermediate situation with um, the lineage being, uh, you know, uh, the lineage sorting not having been completed, the alleles being paraphyletic to those in a sister species is the one that we're really concerned about, and that is what's causing the trouble. Uh, first, a side note, however, um, there seems to be a bit of confusion sometimes. It is important to note that this incomplete lineage sorting does not have any implications for taxonomy, for classification. It does not mean that the species is badly circumscribed. And that has two reasons. First of all, 
this species is non-monophyletic or this species is monophyletic or paraphyletic or something like that. It's not even a meaningful sentence if we are talking about uh, non-clonal species, about anything that's sexually reproducing, precisely for the reason that this graph here uh, indicated. Um, inside the species, we've got a network structure and all the words ending in phyle and phyletic only apply if you've got a tree relationship between the units you're looking at. For example, um, independently evolving species lineages that only very, very rarely exchange genes, but they don't apply within a species. And the second one, it is also a category error because as taxonomists, we don't actually classify the alleles into species. We classify specimens into species and then species into higher order taxa. Um, we are using the gene copies as evidence, but uh, not directly. It's not as if we're saying that allele belongs to that species. You're just swimming around in the species lineages in a way. So we had incomplete lineage sorting and lineage sorting. Again, the idea is that you look uh, from the past to the future and it's the process of alleles slowly becoming monophyletic inside a species lineage. Now, if you reverse your perspective, that is the other important um, uh, term that is used everywhere. If we look back from the present into the past, because the, the present alleles are all the evidence we have to infer what happened in the past, we're talking about coalescence. So the, the idea here is that uh, the extant alleles merge back into the uh, expected ancestors and the species lineages mer merge back into ancestral species lineage, uh, lineages as we look back into time. And a very important mathematical model here is then the coalescent model or coalescent theory that a lot of the phylogenetic analyses that we can use to deal with this um, situation are based upon. And the key problem that we have is uh, not incomplete lineage sorting per se, but what it causes. Um, again, incomplete lineage sorting disappears through lineage sorting through genetic drift over time. But the problem is what happens if it doesn't disappear quickly enough. If there's a lot of space for alleles, that means if uh, effective um, population size is large in a species, it can maintain a lot of the ancestral allele diversity for quite some time. If then the time between speciation events is relatively short, there was no time for lineage sorting to take place before the next speciation event. And then we have a high likelihood of ending up with what is then called a deep coalescence. So that means that the um, alleles, the, the gene copies, um, coalesce into an ancestor that is deeper in time than the actual species divergence took place. And if we then take the gene tree at face value, this might mislead our uh, phylogenetic analysis. It's important here to note that uh, in contrast to incomplete lineage sorting, in contrast to this, this paraphyly of alleles to those in a, as other species, this incongruence stays, this is forever, because um, the moment your, your lineages have sorted out their alleles, they are stuck with that. They might still diversify, of course, in, into new little gene clades, um, but, but the relationships at the bottom, that for example, in, in this lower graph here, uh, things were sorted quite randomly so that now um, we're getting the wrong impression from that one gene tree, that doesn't go away except if an entire species dies out. That is the only solution to this. And that is uh, also why this is less of a problem the further we go into really, really deep phylogenetic questions, because in the end, many uh, lineages go extinct and it's rare that we actually have got uh, all the radiation or a really, really quick radiation that has resulted in all extant lineages uh, that have survived 300 million years or something like that. But it's a very, very common problem with younger problems. So, this took quite a, a lot of introduction. On the other hand, this is a really easy question. How does uh, deep coalescence then present in our gene trees? Well, quite simply, we have gene tree incongruence, but if that is the only issue that's affecting our data, then at least the alleles from each species are relatively closely related uh, still with each other. So, we, we, do have, we do have a problem of how we reconcile this to a species tree, but it is relatively close nonetheless, and, and the major groups should always come out more or less the same. <laughs>
How do we infer the species tree? Uh, in all the cases that I'm talking about, there is a really simple solution. Uh, and the first one here is we simply ignore the problem and we concatenate our data like we would uh, concatenate, concatenate several different chloroplast regions, for example, that are all co-evolving and then just uh, treat all our genes as if they were evolving as one. And that actually works well enough, again, especially with many deeper problems. So um, that is an option that we might at least want to try out. The gold standard, however, that uh, would be uh, most useful also to evolutionary studies is to do a full multi-gene Bayesian species tree analysis, such as implemented, for example, in a very popular software BEAST, as mentioned earlier, with its add-on star BEAST. The advantage of this approach is that it estimates the species tree and all of the gene trees at the same time. And so it can take all that evidence into consideration and checking it against each other to arrive at the best solution. And perhaps a slightly more practical uh, advantage is also that it always assumes some kind of molecular clock. So we always get a rooted tree out of it. We get a posterior distribution of trees out of it because it's a Bayesian analysis. And we can do a lot of very um, sophisticated analysis downstream. However, it has two important downsides that are very relevant to what we're trying to do in uh, Australian angiosperm tree of life, for example, is very computationally intensive um, and very slow. So it's not realistic with hundreds of terminals, with hundreds of species. And it also doesn't deal well when it has got missing data. So if we have a very patchy matrix, so for example, we have uh, 300 genes out of 355 for each individual sample, but unfortunately not the same 300 for each individual sample. So a few are missing in every column. The analysis will really not work very well. So the alternative then are the so-called shortcut methods. Um, in this case, we infer the gene trees first, all individually, and then we use the topology of all the gene trees to infer the most likely species tree under the assumption of coalescence explaining the um, conflicts in our data, deep coalescence explaining the conflicts. A particularly popular option at the moment is the software Astral, but there's a, a wide variety of other software that one can try. It has pretty much the um, inverse advantages and disadvantages as Starbeast. It can deal very well with incomplete gene trees with lots of missing data, and it is extremely fast. On the other hand, the fact that we are not estimating species trees and gene trees at the same time, but that the gene tree topologies are fixed, means that if we got those wrong, if for example, there are poorly supported nodes along the way, which could have just gone the other way around, um, then this analysis might be misled by that kind of uncertainty. And it also seems to be less reliable the deeper you go in time, uh, and it's preferable for the more shallower phylogenetic problems. And in terms of downstream phylogenetic analysis, uh, downstream evolutionary analyses, uh, the branch lengths inferred by these kinds of shortcut uh, methods are generally meaningless. So we would have to then at, at the very least do some kind of penalized likelihood time calibration if we want to do biogeographic analysis with it, for example. But that was uh, relatively straightforward. That problem is long understood and there are lots and lots of software options. A bit more complicated already is uh, gene duplication and loss. So what happens in this case? Our second problem, uh, as the name says, we have an ancestor in which uh, potentially just a single gene has been duplicated into, in this case, a red and a blue copy. And both copies may then uh, potentially be inherited by all the descendant species. If we have an entire genome duplication event, polyploidy, then we would have an enormous number of genes showing exactly the same pattern. Potentially then over time, um, either the gene copies might specialize. Um, that's, of course, one of the key drivers of innovation and evolution. Or if they're superfluous to requirements, at some point, the genes can also be lost again. If we then look at various gene variants that have been produced by these gene duplication events across different species lineages, the two terms that we use are orthologs and paralogs. So if across all the samples that we've got in our analysis, we are always lucky enough to grab the red copy, for example, and compare them all against each other, then we're comparing orthologs. All the red lineages are, of genes are an ortholog group. 
If, however, we are unlucky to, enough to unwittingly uh, grab red and blue copies, uh, a mix of them from different species lineages and try to do an analysis on them, then we are comparing paralogs. And the problem with that is that then the phylogeny of the gene family of, of these different ortholog groups interferes with the species phylogeny that we're actually interested in um, as phylogeneticists and systematists at any rate, of course. If, if we're interested in the evolution of this family, then it's a different story, but we don't want to mix them up. So just as an example of what that looks like in one of my data sets, in this case, the daisy bushes, uh, this is not even an extreme example, but you can immediately see that there are some variants of this gene uh, that stand out because they're missing this one amino acid. Uh, and you can see that this same um, paralog is present in four of my species. And then variants that have got that amino acid are also present in all the same four species. And you can see similar patterns then with some of the nucleotide differences with some of the SNPs in these genes. So uh, this is just an example of of really visually immediately seeing that something is, is really a bit odd here. Now, how does that then present in our gene trees? Ideally, and, and again, this is a naive assumption, ideally, if we have got all the sequences that we can get, we have got absolutely no gene losses, uh, everything is beautifully clear, then at the moment in our species tree where a gene or genome duplication event happened, we should then find the same species twice on the gene tree with more or less the same relationships in, in two parallel clades. So for n gene duplication events, we should have n uh, species duplications on the gene tree in a sense, sometimes with more, sometimes with less. Now, again, that is an unrealistic assumption. In reality, uh, we sometimes simply fail to amplify or capture uh, a allele or a gene copy. Um, in some cases, obviously, a gene is superfluous to requirements and was lost. And so in the lower tree here, you see that um, I assume that in the upper ortholog group, uh, the red copy has been lost, or rather, the red species has lost the copy for the ortholog group one, I should say. And then five different species have lost the copy from ortholog group two, but there's still uh, quite a bit of overlap between those two ortholog groups in terms of the species that have them. So we can see what is going on just as in the alignment. How do we then deal with that situation? Again, uh, just as with simply ignoring deep coalescence, there's also a way of simply ignoring this problem in a way we just um, throw away all the genes in which we find paralogy and analyze only the rest. Now, clearly that is uh, a valid option if let's say I've got 300 genes and 30 of them have paralogs, it's gonna be a bit more painful if I've got 300 genes and 200 of them have paralogs because I'm throwing away the majority of my data. So we may wanna um, use some more sophisticated approaches. There are methods out there that bypass any bound formatic solution and they use the gene trees that include all the paralogs that we have assembled directly for phylogenetic analysis and these are again shortcut methods. In a really old method that's been around for quite some time is a parsimony method called minimized gene duplications and losses. It does exactly what it says on the tin and is uh, implemented, for example, in the software IGTP, but also in the fairly well-known package MISKEAT. And fairly recently, a likelihood alternative using the same logic has been published under the name GeneRax. However, mostly people deal with paralogy using bound formatics approaches. And the one that uh, Chris uh, Jackson has implemented in the analysis pipeline for use in uh, the Australian Andrew Sperm Tree of Life project is the Yang and Smith pipeline uh, that was first published in 2014. And the idea here is to script automatically exactly the same approach that we would intuitively uh, take if we were to manually figure out where ortholog groups are. So we, we just discussed We've got these two um, clades that show duplicated species, uh, and then, uh, then we assume there must have been a gene or genome duplication event between them. And so we would kind of take the uh, scissors to them and we take those two ortholog groups apart. The failure mode for this 
approach is if we have got so many losses or failures to amplify that we actually don't have these overlaps anymore. So in the lower um, case here, the first ortholog group is not present in uh, five species and the lower ortholog group two is not present in five species. And because they are just uh, complementary in their losses, we will not be able to tell um, that there is actually a genome genome duplication event in this case. However, this is ever less likely to be an issue the larger your study group are, the more samples you've got in your analysis. And just very quickly to illustrate uh, with a practical example what the outcomes are of some of the scripts that are available. So the Yang and Smith pipeline actually has four options, uh, one of which is simply to kick out all the genes with parallax. But in terms of the more sophisticated approaches, uh, there is this script called monophyletic outgroups. Uh, the idea is you do have an outgroup um, and you move successively up from the root through your tree. You check if there are duplications between uh, the sister clades at each node, and then you cut out and throw away the smaller one, um, rationalizing that at that moment there must have been a duplication event, and you keep whatever gives you more information for your phylogenetic analysis. So relatively simple and logical and straightforward. Then at the extreme end of the spectrum, there is another approach uh, there that is called maximum inclusion. And this quite simply iteratively takes apart the unrooted phylogeny into uh, pieces that do not show overlap in taxa, starting with the biggest um, clan it can find. Well, this is a very permissive approach. You may end up with quite a large number of uh, very small orthologue groups that might not have a lot of information. And this is actually not being recommended by uh, Yang and Smith. But so we've got different options um, with different logic that we can examine. And finally, uh, just for clarification, uh, pathology is not necessarily always an issue just because we have got, for example, genome duplication. If you are worried about polyploidy, but as in some groups that I've studied, all the polyploidy happens in the terminals just within individual species, that is not really an issue. Because what we are worried about here is ancestral duplication that will actually interfere with the species phylogeny. But if all the action happens in the terminals, then of course that doesn't really have a phylogenetic import. And um, in a sense, what you're then seeing uh, in those extra copies that have appeared is, is pretty much indistinguishable from simply having different alleles in your uh, samples, which are uh, you know, similar enough to be taken care of by standard approaches. Finally, then coming to the third, uh, complex of problems, reticulation of any kind. So in this case, I want to quickly talk separately about three scenarios. The first would be hybrid speciation, in particular allopolyploid speciation. The second then is much lower level reticulation, introgression, backcrossing, admixture. There are lots and lots of words that are used by different subfields of um, evolutionary biology. And then finally, a special case of the former chloroplast capture. Allopolyploid speciation is fairly wide known. And in fact, there is a uh, example that all of us will have already encountered uh, in pestles and in chewing gums. So it's, it's, it's very common. Uh, the humble spearmint uh, is actually an allotetraploid hybridogenic species that has been derived from two other European species of true mints. So what happens is you have a um, cross between two species. The hybrid might be fairly sterile or at least subfertile. And then if um, that hybrid manages to duplicate its genome, generally uh, through some kind of meiosis errors, fertility is restored. And we have a new species lineage that might then even diversify into an entire clade if it is lucky. And that already kind of indicates then how it would present in the data. Ideally, um, if we have a situation uh, where an allopolyploid was created by species in two different clades, then we would find for every single gene tree two different copies in that uh, hybrid or hybridogenic species, one derived from the maternal clade and the other one from the paternal clade. So gene after gene, we would kind of find a situation a bit like illustrated here where they're always sitting uh, close together with their ancestors. 
Of course, that is again uh, idealistic assumption. In reality, um, we sometimes may not amplify all the copies or some genes may have been lost. And of course, all the other problems interfere with it. So we may see gene tree incongruence making it slightly harder to understand what is going on. How do we then in this situation like this get from our alignments or from our gene trees to the species tree? Again, there is a brutal and simplistic option, which is that we simply throw out all the known hybrids and hybrid lineages because we are using analyses that assume a tree-like structure of the data in the first place, and then we maybe reinsert them afterwards. A uh, more formalized way of, of doing that automatic and analytically is uh, the hype Pfizer pipeline, hype pipeline uh, developed by Lars Nauheimer. And that is actually the topic of uh, the separate talk that I mentioned earlier and of one of the workshops at the ASBS conference. And in this case, the idea is to separate out the reads that uh, belong to both of the um, ancestral lineages and then analyze those contributions separately and then just as I intuitively described earlier figure out what uh, ancestral clades have contributed to your hybrid or hybridic species. And that talk is going to take place on the 10th of June same time as this one and uh, please visit the BioCommons website if you are interested in signing up for it. A bit less straightforward perhaps um, is if we have got less gene flow and and especially a result that is less than 50 50 from the ancestral uh, lineage and again there's a lot of words for this is it introgression it is hybrids back crossing it is a mixture um, and in that case we may only see a few genes affected or we may see only part of a species affected and of course, that rises, raise, raises immediately the problem, well, how do we distinguish that from deep coalescence then? And there are, there are two considerations here. One is um, whether we can have some kind of test that tells us which of the two might explain what is going on. And the other one is if we can have some kind of phylogenetic network analysis um, to figure out the relationships. In, in terms of tests, one option that has been mentioned in this context is the traditional ABBA, BABA test. The idea here is that we uh, reduce our problem down to a simple case of three species and an outgroup. And in that case, we should find um, a relationship where lots of alleles are shared by the two most closely related species. Uh, and then the outgroup and the third species share the other allele. Now, if then we have considerably more um, allele distributions that diverge from this, then we would expect from a purely stochastic um, deep coalescence and an incomplete lineage sorting model, then we would say, okay, that is strong evidence now that we have got gene flow between those species going on. Um, the problem with this for our present purposes is that it uses allele frequencies. So really, ideally, you have a data set with lots of single nucleotide polymorphisms and multiple individuals for spe and per species for good results. But it is something that some of us uh, might be interested in exploring. A test more suited perhaps to the kind of data we're using for Australian angiosperm tree of life was developed uh, in 2009 by Jolie et al. In this case, a simulation test is conducted where they are trying to compare the estimated age of the gene tree coalescences versus the age of the species tree coalescence. And in the case, as illustrated here in the figure from their paper uh, in figure B, in the case where then uh, the gene tree coalescence is considerably deeper than the species tree coalescence, then you can say, okay, this must have been hybridization. Unfortunately, as also indicated then in figures C and D uh, of their paper, there are uh, several other scenarios where hybridization did take place or introgression did take place, but the first test will fail to detect it precisely because of the unrelated problem of uh, incomplete linear sorting and deep coalescence. So it's, it's an asymmetric test in a way. There are phylogenetic network analyses. Um, a particularly well-known one is conducted by the software BPP. And then more recently, um, another software called SNARK has been published. So the idea in this case is that different um, models 
are compared uh, with simply divergent structures with simply tree structures and then where you add an event here or there uh, of lateral gene transfer of introgression between species and the analysis tries to explain the data under these assumptions. The problem with that, it is generally fairly computationally intensive to compare all those different models, all those different scenarios. Uh, it's relatively slow and is limited to um, a few species, may maybe five or six are what, what you mostly see in the literature. And there are then also some other um, somewhat simpler uh, phylogenetic network methods um, that can maybe accommodate a few more species. Finally, a uh, separate comment on what might be considered a special case of introgression, but is particularly important um, in phylogenetics. Uh, organelles are known to jump between species more easily than nuclear genes. And in our case, of course, as botanists, we would be concerned about uh, chloroplasts, which is then called chloroplast capture by other species lineages. And for example, people who work in eucalypts will be very familiar with that situation. So how does that present in the data then? Well, we would expect if chloroplast capture is the explanation for the incongruence, we're seeing that nuclear data more or less consistently supports one topology and chloroplast data another. So for example, if we have um, a ribosomal tree, and we have our capture tree with 300 different genes and uh, we fairly consistently get one relationship but the chloroplast annoyingly gives us another uh, then we might want to consider well maybe this is due to chloroplast capture so in, such in this example here now i have spoken largely about ideal scenarios uh, the problem is of course in reality we generally don't have an a priori knowledge of what is going on and the data may be a bit complicated. So it's important to understand that a lot of what we do, we base on our assumptions of what is plausible. So we need to understand the biology of our species. We may need to understand the geography. We may need to understand uh, the age of the lineages. And, and then we take all of this uh, as, as circumstantial information that we apply to the incongruences that we see. And one thing that we need to keep in mind is that both being able to hybridize with each other, um, but also the deep coalescence problem should peter out the more distant the lineages are. So it's, it's much less likely that you've got a deep coalescence between things that are 20 million years apart than between things that are 1.5 million years apart. And it's much less likely to, to hybridize a eucalypt with a daisy than it is to hybridize different eucalypts. So if we've got really, 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 really deep incongruence, uh, what's either an error we made in the assembly or it is then more likely to be paralogy, but um, distinguishing the other two is probably the trickier issue. So in summary, we have discussed deep coalescence. It is caused purely randomly, um, especially if there are large population sizes and rapid successive speciations. And we have got a variety of phylogenetic methods to solve that problem. We have got um, paralogy, gene, gene duplication, uh, or genome duplication. And in that case, we have got both some shortcut methods and bioinformatic solutions for the identification of the various ortholog groups at our disposal. And we have got reticulation in the form of either hybrid speciation or, or more limited introgression. And in that case, there are tests available to figure out what is going on and phylogenetic methods, at least for cases of few species. And again, the ideal cases are easy to recognize, but in reality, uh, we will often find slightly more incomplete data sets. And the key problem is all of them can potentially happen in the same phylogeny. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a variety of resources attached to this talk that you will see when the uh, PDF becomes available. But for the moment, I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion that we can have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. We do now have time for questions. If you have a question for Alexander, please write that into the Q&A panel in your Zoom dashboard, and we can answer those for you. And while you're thinking about questions, I'll pop the links to the next webinar and to the workshops back up on the screen again. So as Alexander mentioned, the next webinar will be on the 10th of June, and you can find more information about that on the Australian Biocommons website.
And there will be a series of workshops at the ASBS conference in July. The information about those workshops is on the conference website and you can see those links there. As mentioned, these slides will be made available alongside the recording and we will link them from the description in YouTube so you'll be able to find them there. So as there are no questions this afternoon, we will leave it there for today. Finally, thank you again, Alexander, for a wonderful presentation and thank you to all of us for joining us. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS funding via Bioplatforms Australia. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you in another webinar again soon. Enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now.